Let's start in Florida, and this is the case of Reeves, the defendant, 71-year-old at the time of the incident. This was eight years ago. He was in a movie theater. The victim was in the movie theater, Chad Olson. As a result, they got in an altercation, and the victim was killed by a gunshot wound to the chest. Now, the defendant in this case says... It is because he was standing his ground, that he had a reasonable belief that his life was threatened. And as a result, he shot the victim on the right of your screen. Now joining us for our exclusive discussion about this, Nicole Olson, the victim's wife. It is her attorney, TJ Grimaldi. Thank you so much for being with us, TJ. I greatly appreciate your time. I I'm gonna start, of course, as we discuss some hard questions and the why behind all of this with the thought that our condolences are with this family. Uh, this was Nicole's husband. He was a father that was the victim in this shooting. Um, and all of our thoughts go to her and the family. Let's start with that. How is Nicole doing? This happened eight years ago. How is she today, TJ? First of all, thanks for having me on and thanks for the kind words about uh, my client. Um, you know, this has been a very, very long time coming. She has good days and bad. Um, I would say that this is a bittersweet time in the sense that she has been preparing and hoping for this day for over eight years. But it's also very stressful and very difficult on her uh, when these sorts of things happen because she basically has to relive it on a everyday basis. And in reliving it, let's jump to the crux of the matter because I'll tell you I'm a former judge and there are no cases that took eight years to get to trial. So in your opinion as her attorney, why eight years before this case is finally going to trial? The defendant is now 79 years old. Well, I think there's a lot of reasons for that, and I agree with you. No case should ever take eight years. In fact, the chief uh, state attorney in Pinellas County has called it a joke and called it embarrassing for our criminal justice system that it's taken this long. I believe the Boston bomber was tried in less than a year. Um, uh, my position is that I believe that it has been the defense's attempt to delay this case with every possible turn that they can do because they know that if their client spends even one more day in jail, it's a death sentence for him. If you combine that with the unfortunate uh, perfect storm of delays, uh, that's why we've gone eight years. They had a stand your ground uh, hearing that took a month. They then appealed that ruling because they did not believe that it was a correct ruling and because of the change of the law here in Florida uh, of senior ground shifting the burden. There was also COVID that's taken about a year and a half uh, just to get us back in here. So there's, there's lots of reasons for delay, but the main reason in my opinion is that the defense team knows that he's gonna be found guilty. And if he is, he has to go to jail. And if he has to go to jail, he's not gonna survive. How did your client feel about the fact that we know he's out on bond, he is on house arrest, as I understand, he has an ankle monitor. So for the last eight years, he has been restricted, his freedoms are restricted, but he is not in jail. How has she handled that aspect of this case? Well, I think what's made that the most difficult was that at the very beginning when he requested bond, his bond was denied. Um, Unfortunately, that was probably the wrong conclusion and they appealed that as well and got him out on house arrest. I think what's been more difficult for my client is approximately five to six years into this thing, the defense tried to have the house arrest lifted and requested that all uh, ankle monitors and restrictions that he have be completely lifted and him be basically a free man because he's been quote unquote, such a good boy during all this time. I found it a farce that they would even bring this to the court's attention because the only reason that he's been sitting there in house arrest for eight years now is because of their delays. And so thankfully the judge saw right through that and said, no, this is the very minimum restriction that, we're, that he has and he's gonna continue to have the ankle monitor and, and restrictions. It's difficult for my client to swallow, obviously, because he gets to be home with his family, with his grandkids, with his wife, with his children while she has to continue to learn how to be a single mom to a now 10 year old child who understands things a little bit differently than she did when she was two and is therefore asking a lot of questions about why this man killed her dad. 
So I want to push back a little bit because, again, as a former judge, one of the things I know is that, um, for instance, defense didn't control how long a case might get continued or all the reasons why a case is continued. So I know that you've expressed the defense's delays and things that they've done. But ultimately, would you agree with me that it, it, there have to be other reasons? There have to be other factors. It can't be just for our viewers' um, information and education. It can't just be because defense counsel says, I don't want this trial to happen yet. We want him to stay in his home for a little bit longer before we go. And eight years later, here we are. You are 100% correct. Uh, however, there are tactics used in defense of a criminal case that can basically do that without actually doing without actually doing it and saying, no, we're not going to be ready for trial yet. There's different tactics that they can do. They can appeal different things. They can form, formulate different motions. They have changed experts, which has also caused delay. There are different things that they can do in order to put themselves in a position to continue to delay unnecessarily. And I think this defense team has done just that very, very well. And let's talk now about Nicole. Let's start with reason number one, and viewers want to know, um, you don't always see a victim's spouse have their own attorney. So can you start by telling us, in this case, why Nicole does have representation and, and how um, she needs to be assisted through this process? Sure. So as you can imagine, and as you guys have known, this case has taken on international media status. Uh, it was on... Uh, many, many uh, national TV stations. It was on dailymail.com. It was on every website you can possibly imagine. And because of that intrigue and because of just the pressures of this type of case, it's just important for someone to make sure that they know what their rights are and know what they, what they can expect. And more importantly, to explain how this process works. Additionally, she also retained me obviously from the civil side of the case which has since been resolved. And what are you able to tell us about the civil case in terms of any of, of the facts of that or anything surrounding that that you're allowed to share with us? Uh, so I can tell you that we did bring a uh, claim against the defendant, Curtis Reeves. We also did file a lawsuit against the manager of the movie complex as well as the movie complex themselves for negligence. Um, but unfortunately, I can't get into specifics related to what occurred in the case other than to tell you the case has now been resolved. All right. So let's shift our attention then back to this criminal trial, eight years in the making. The defendant now 79. Nicole, your client lost her husband in this altercation in which he was shot in the chest. Jury selection, day four of jury selection today. We know that questions were asked to get a pool of jurors. And then after that, the individual attorneys for the defense and the prosecution, starting with the prosecution, were allowed to ask them questions to try to determine which of the qualified jurors will then sit on this jury. How is that jury selection going from your perspective? So first, let's keep in mind that Mrs. Olson is not just dealing with the death of her husband. If you remember, she was also shot in her hand and more specifically in her on her wedding ring finger. They had to cut her wedding ring off. And so she's gonna have that reminder physically for the rest of her life. Her finger is mangled and, and is still problematic. So she's gonna always have that reminder. Forget about just the, the loss she has in her heart and in her mind related to her husband. But as far as from a jury perspective and trying to find a panel, I had a feeling all along that this was gonna be very, very difficult. You're in a relatively small town and you're dealing with a case that's probably the largest case that has ever been handled in Dade City and Pasco County in general. And because of the media scrutiny that this had, and more importantly, because this lasted for so long, I'm sure it has been very, very difficult on all the attorneys involved to be able to find the correct jury that can make a reasonable decision based on the facts that they're presented rather than what they've already heard during this past eight years. And do you feel, TJ, like they're um, like both sides are doing a good job really ferreting out any biases? Because, of course, when they select a juror, they want to make certain that they're not biased to either side so that they can render a fair decision after deliberating based on the evidence presented. Do you think that the attorneys are asking the right questions to get to that place? 
Uh, I think so. I think, as, as you know, with your experience in the criminal justice system, just because you ask the right questions don't, doesn't necessarily mean you get the right answers that you're hoping for or searching for. Uh, some jurors out there make statements during voir dire that to get them off of the case, while other jurors make comments or potential jurors make comments or statements during voir dire in order to get them on the jury. The difficulty is for these attorneys is always to find out who is actually telling the truth and who in the defense's mind versus the prosecution's mind, who is going to make the most fair and impartial witness for their version of the fact. And we know there are a couple of cases now in the news about jurors who didn't disclose allegedly or didn't answer things truthfully on the juror questionnaire, to your point. And so now that can open up grounds for appeal down the road. And we're hearing about that in some of the news and some other high profile cases. TJ, you're going to stay with us. We do need to take a break. When we come back, we're going to continue speaking with TJ Grimaldi, who is the attorney for Nicole in this case. This is an important message for everyone on Medicare. Today, we are talking about Medicare Part C, commonly called Medicare Advantage. If you don't have a Medicare Part C plan, call now because there may be plans with additional benefits available that are simply not covered under Medicare Parts A and B. That's right. There are people on Medicare but don't have a Medicare Part C plan, which covers everything in Part A and Part B, plus extra benefits in Medicare Part C. Here's the good news. If you're on Medicare, you can call even if you called last year, we will check to see if there is a Part C plan available in your area. And back to our one-on-one -on -one conversation with T.J. Grimaldi, the attorney for Chad Olson's wife, Nicole. T.J., what was your rea uh, your reaction initially when you heard that interview? We just played a very small piece of it that Curtis Reeves, the defendant in this case, did with the police shortly after the incident. <laughs> What surprised me the most was actually the comments that you didn't play because he started creating or talking about facts that did not occur. And I think the reason he did that is because of his background in training in law enforcement and trying to already plant the seed that he was in fear and he was trying to protect himself. He even said as much that, that Chad was basically pinning him back against his seat or against the wall, which none of that occurred. Curtis Reeves made these statements not knowing that there was a video of the entire event. And I think that not enough uh, pressure or not enough focus has been on these statements because I think from the very beginning, it shows that he how calculated he was in this entire event and how he was trying to create a self-defense claim when none existed, not knowing that he was gonna be basically called out with this video that you're now showing. All right, we're going to talk about that video in just, well, first let's talk about the video, and then I want to circle back to facts that you say did not occur. In this video, though, if you watch this video, it does appear as if the victim in this case did get in front of the defendant and did something. Now, I know that what, what we've heard and been told is that he threw a bag of popcorn, but do you all dispute or deny that the victim, and I'm not victim blaming, please don't misunderstand me, but that he was standing in front of the defendant doing something in this video. That's what it looks like. Well, there, there has never been a denial that Chad Olson grabbed his popcorn and threw his popcorn in his face, but I still don't understand how that would equate to then being shot in the heart. Um, the interesting thing is that you you position your question as that, my, that Chad Olson was standing ahead of him. The problem actually started way before that because the Olsons were already in the movie theater, already sitting down and already inhabiting their seats well prior to the Reeves even getting there. And it was the Reeves' decision to sit where they sat, which was directly behind the Olsons. If they didn't like that position or if they didn't want to sit there or if they didn't want to be bothered, all they had to do was get up and move. This was not a completely full movie theater, and they weren't assigned to any seats. They purposely picked these seats, and that's when Curtis Reeves decided to become a cop again and start ordering people and directing people what to do. And when that didn't occur and people didn't listen to him and, and asked how high they wanted him to jump because he's not a cop anymore, that infuriated him. And that's why he continued to lean in, continued to try to pick the fight and then go outside the theater and hit management and then provoke Chad Olson even more once he returned. 
And tell me, so you you mentioned in the uh, interview that law enforcement again did with the defendant in this case that there were facts that did not occur that the defendant say did. And so one of them you mentioned was that Chad had pinned him back um, in his chair and that that didn't occur. What other facts stand out to you that the defendant said this happened and your client says no it didn't? Well, I, I, there's some debate about a phone. Uh, the defense's position is that that Chad Olson threw a phone at Mr. Reeves. I, I don't know anyone in this day and age uh, because we rely on our phones so much that of anyone that would throw a cell phone at someone else. Secondly, there is absolutely nothing in the video showing that a cell phone was thrown. While a cell phone was on the ground, there is absolutely no indication that one was thrown. Additionally, Mr. Reeves tried to suggest that he was also struck in the eye or in the glasses by uh, Chad Olson, and that never occurred either. The only thing that occurred is that my that Chad Olson stood up, confronted him after constantly being ordered and directed what to do by this gentleman that had no reason to do so, and then leaned forward, grabbed the popcorn, throw it in his face, and then as you can see in the video, retreat. But by the time that he was retreated, he was already being blown away by this person who said, I will teach you to throw popcorn in my face. TJ, how are you preparing Nicole to testify, knowing what you just described, that she's able to testify as an eyewitness. She was there when this happened. She too was shot, as you pointed out earlier. And she has to testify saying that this defendant has said a lot of things that aren't true. Well, in my opinion, the greatest thing uh, that we have going for Nicole's testimony and the reason why she is so she makes such a good witness is that all she's doing is relying on the truth she, her position has never changed her memory has never faded her description of what has occurred has never been any different and she has always said the same thing and so to prepare her hasn't been very difficult to prepare with the stress is what's more difficult to prepare her to make her statement as a witness has not been because she has constantly said the same thing and all she's doing is stating the truth, which is the facts that occurred that afternoon. And was she, what would she say to this, TJ? Was she in fear of her own life in that movie theater? I, I don't think she thought it was anything more than two men disagreeing about something and wondering why this older gentleman kept trying to direct what was gonna happen between other individuals in that theater. I think beyond that, she had no clue that it would ever escalate to something like this. And what about, you know, there's also evidence that it's suggested it will be presented during this trial that she in fact was trying to at one point hold her husband Chad back. And again, for those joining us, Chad was the victim in this case, shot in the chest and killed, that she was trying to hold him back before this altercation escalated. She has never once indicated that she was trying to hold him back. She has never once stated that she was even trying to hold him back. All she has stated is that she was reaching up across her body to get her husband's attention, to basically say, come on, sit down. There was no holding back because there was no reason to be held back. She didn't comprehend. She never got the impression. Chad never gave off any suggestion that, he, that this would turn into some sort of fight because Chad was not a violent person. He was not a, an aggressive person. And so she was doing nothing more than just to get her husband's attention and say, listen, let's forget this, turn around, it's just not worth it. The only reason and the only potential person that is saying that she was trying to hold him back is the defense attorneys, because they're trying to suggest that, that Chad Olson was more of an aggressor and try to suggest that he was enraged and needed to be held back. Nothing can be further from the truth. And I know you mentioned their daughter. They have a 10-year-old, 10 now, two at the time of this incident that was eight years ago in this movie theater. What does justice look like for Nicole? Well, unfortunately, the only thing that would, that would be perfect would be to somehow get her husband back. But because that's not practical and that's not something that can happen, the only thing that, that is justice in this case is that Curtis Reeves spends the rest of his natural life behind bars. Is there anything else, two more questions. First of all, is there anything else that you believe Nicole would want viewers to hear or know about this case? I, I think Nicole would just want everyone to know that her husband was a kind man, was a gentle man, was not a fighter, had never had any problems with the law or anything along those lines, and that 
these sorts of things can't happen. And she, of course, is suffering on her own, but she wants to make sure that people that do these sorts of things are found guilty so that there's a precedent moving forward. And if unfortunately something like this were to happen again, they would be able to use this case to suggest that the, the criminal justice system got it right. And the person that shot someone over popcorn in a movie theater is behind bars as they should be. All right. And TJ, as her attorney, Nicole's attorney, is there anything else that you would want to say to viewers watching and following this trial in Florida? I would say, please have your thoughts and prayers on uh, for my client and uh, her deceased husband. Please, if there, if you know of anyone that has these sorts of problems, make sure that they reach out to law enforcement as well. And just hopefully we can get this one right. And it's not another blunder in the uh, criminal justice system of Florida of getting these big high profile cases wrong. And Curtis Reeves is found guilty and does spend the rest of his life in prison. TJ Gormal, the attorney for Nicole Olson, the widow of the victim in this case, Chad, thank you so much for joining us here on Court TV this afternoon.